you don't want to like write yourself into a story. You want to be you want to be cast. You want to you want someone to say you. I want you for this. And that's the Lord saying you. I want you for this. You're not perfect. You don't look perfect. You're not going to get it right. You don't understand everything. You're, everything is not going to go perfectly. But you're irreplaceable. Sarah Swafford is a globally recognized Catholic speaker and author. Her latest book, co-authored with her husband, Dr. Andrew Swafford, is entitled Gift and Grit, How Heroic Virtue Can Change Your Life and Relationships. Listen in as we discuss her work, the challenges facing relationships today, and the great need to invite people to know Christ as a life of adventure. Benedictine College is transforming culture in America, one conversation at a time. From our studios in Atchison, Kansas, these are the Benedictine Dialogues. Sarah, welcome to the Benedictine Dialogues. Thank you for having me. I've been jealous of all my friends that have got to come and do this, <laughs> yeah. so, and my husband. So, hey, thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, good to have you here. Really been looking forward to this. It's uh, been good to get to know you as well. I mean, you know, we've known each other now for a little while, but moving here and getting to know you and your family and everything has just been really Same. great. So. Ditto, friend. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe to kind of get us started, um, tell me a little bit about, I know you went here to Benedictine College. Thank tell you. me a little bit about your experience uh, here. Oh, well, I'm so glad we have four hours to talk about my, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, well, well, a lot of people will ask me, where are you from? And I'll say, I'm from Atchison. And they're like, no, where are you really from? I'm like, I'm really from Atchison. Um, because, you know, people do grow up here. Yeah. So my mom and dad met at Benedictine. And uh, they are alums. So I'm a legacy student. Nice. And um, my mom actually got the job as a dorm director the night I was born. So they, like, went out for dinner and celebrated. And then I was born the same night. Okay. So... I actually, I think I hold some type of a record or something <laughs> as a person who has probably lived on campus more than anyone other than a monk, I think. I think that's the record that I'm hoping that I hold um, because I grew up on campus. My mom was a dorm director, so 10 years um, as a kid. So my memories, my childhood memories are learning how to ride my bike down the middle of campus, that's sledding nice. on the hills, seeing the monks and uh, trying to get my homework done so I could go to the basketball games. Yeah. And um, so I just have the coolest memories as a kid. We moved out the summer that I turned 10. Okay. Um, and then I ended up coming to Benedictine for school. So I lived on campus as a student. And then I actually was an RD myself for three years. So I don't know how many years that is, but people will ask, like, do you love Benedictine? And I'm like, I don't think you understand how much I, <laughs> I, I knew the fight song when I was about three years old. Yeah. And I always joke that I bleed red and black. So, That's awesome. uh, so yes, I am, I'm a very proud townie and I love that I was born in the Atchison hospital. So, so you've seen then, cause I mean the, co the college in the past 20, 25 years has just grown exponentially. So you've seen all of that. I have. And it's really, I'm so blessed. We just had the scholarship ball, you know, not too long ago. And uh, I always just walk around the scholarship ball and I get emotional. I mean, yeah. first the videos absolutely slay me. I am always just like like a proud big sister or mom because yeah. I know so many of the students. But um, but really just walking around and seeing all the generations of Ravens, you know, because I, I, again, my parents, I grew up with a lot of mm -hmm. my parents' friends who all went to college together and uh, present menace and that whole crowd. And, and then just being able to watch, you know, when I was in school at Benedictine, we were part of the guinea pig Bible studies for Focus. Mm. So oh, nice. the Focus yeah, felt, yeah. I think a lot of people know that Focus was um, kind of tested out at Benedictine in the early 2000s. And um, I was in some of those beginning Bible studies. And I just was so honored to be at Benedictine during its time of, of real, I don't want to say, you know, conversion, but it, it was a pretty, you know, my husband and I graduated in 2004. So a lot of people will say, oh, I know why you went to Benedictine. I'm like, well, hold up. The Benedictine I went to, I mean, it was very different. We were just, we were small but mighty. You yeah. know, there, was, there wasn't there was very many students. I think we had about, you know, maybe 900, 1,000 students. Yeah. So we were about half the size we are now. Um, and then the faith was just really taking off. And yeah. so being a part of that was so beautiful. And I'm just so grateful. So many of my friends, we all, a lot of us work in ministry in some way. And yeah. I really attribute it to just a fire that was set in our hearts. I mean, my husband, Dr. Yeah. Swafford, uh, Doc Swaff, um, he came in as you know a linebacker for the football team. Uh, we joke that I don't think he read a book in high school. <laughs> um, kidding, but not. And then came to Benedictine and just had his life completely changed and then went on to win the St. Anselm Award, which is the highest award you can win in theology. So I always That's tell awesome. people, hey, there's hope for everyone. You know, you walk in as <laughs> walk in a swath and leave, you know, uh, Dr. Swafford in some ways. And so we're, we're just, we're, I'm so blessed, you know, yeah. Benedictine, just, I owe so much to the college and that's a big reason why we're both here. You know, Swaff and I prayed really hard about where we wanted to be and 
all signs and the Holy Spirit just always pointed back at Benedictine. That's awesome. So then what did, what did you uh, study while you were here? Yeah, so um, my, my dad, I still laugh because I was a theology major and a marketing major. And <laughs> so I did business and yeah. I did theology. And I joke that I, I think I did theology because I was just having my mind blown. Mm. I took so many classes from Dr. Ted Shree yeah. and Dr. Shia. And I just, I mean, I was just like signing up for fun. Like my extracurriculars were literally like theology. Um, and then I just, you know, again, through my conversion, just kept, you know, closer and closer to the Lord. And, um, but I loved business. I loved marketing. I loved management. So when I graduated, my dad's like, what are you going to do with your life? And I kind of just laughed. I was like, oh no. Um, and then we were at a seat conference years, like, I mean, probably 10 years later, we were at a seat conference and I was giving a talk. And, um, I remember seeing my mom and dad later that day. And my dad like looked at me and he goes, I figured it out. You actually use your degrees. You market Jesus Christ. Like this That's works awesome. so, like you figured it out. You yeah. know, you're doing what God wanted you to do with your degrees. And, um, but I, it's really cool. I actually do use both of my degrees a lot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I love that the Lord pointed me in those directions, so, yeah. especially as a, a mom, a homeschool mom and a wife and a minister. I really do use both of them a lot. That's awesome. So tell me a little bit about your, your kind of path towards getting into ministry. Was it something that, I mean, you kind of mentioned that you didn't necessarily see yourself doing that maybe, or, no. or was it just kind of of a <laughs> oh, Jerry. Holy Spirit moment oh, along Jerry. the way, or several yeah. Holy Spirit moments along the way. What is the, yeah, the, the St. Teresa of Calcutta quote, God doesn't qualify the call, yeah. he calls the call, you know, or whatever, <laughs> you know, not qualified is what I'm trying to say. So, um, yeah, I used to always joke with people because, especially public speaking, you know, people be like, cute, you know, people come up and be like, did you always want to be a motivational speaker? Yeah. And I'm like, absolutely not. You know, like that was, <laughs> I was terrified. And, um, my dad used to make me read at church because it was good for me in high school. And I used to just get up there and shake so bad. And like the whole podium, the ambo would shake. And like I would get done and these after church, these cute little ladies would come up and be like, you tried so hard. And I'd be like, I almost threw up. I'm never doing that again, you know? So I just, I, I am not, I was not a public speaker. I did not know how to, you know, I didn't like any of that. But what I found was actually through being a dorm director, hmm. being a, an RD, I started just, again, like I wouldn't even have called it ministry. I was just loving on my girls. You right. know, I, I was in St. Scholastica, which is 142 freshmen women. Um, and so I had all the freshmen and then I had two little boys under two. So I was, I was really just living my life and trying to just love them and meet them where they were. And it's actually when social media started. So I, the, the year I was in the dorm was the year Facebook came out. Okay. Or kind of hit the scene, you know. And I remember looking at my husband and I was like, this is going to change the way people date forever. I mean, profit, right? Like, but not really. I just, I kind of just sat back and was like, man, this would have been really hard for me mm -hmm. when I was in high school, college, dating. You know, I had only been married a couple of years, but I was like, we didn't even have text messaging when we yeah. were, we did long distance. And I was like, man, I would have given anything for FaceTime or whatever. <laughs> I mean, that would have been amazing. But it's just this whole new way of communicating. And yeah. so I was... Truly, I was just loving on my girls. And um, so I started having groups of girls. A lot of people would be like, "Let's can we go to coffee and stuff? So I would, I would go to coffee. I would hang out. We would talk. Um, a lot of times I would go on walks with the boys. And then all of a sudden I'd have like six girls walking with me. And we would just be talking about life. And so, but then it got to the point where I just couldn't go one-on-one -on -one with everyone. And my, my little 600 square foot apartment was not big enough to house everyone. And so the girls were like, you got to give a talk about this. And I'm like, about what? And they're like, what you talk about. I'm mm. like, what do I talk about? And they're like, what you talk about? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what this is. Because I, I wasn't even thinking about it in a way of just how do I help, you know? Mm. And it's messy out there. How do I help? So I ended up giving a talk one night on campus. And I thought maybe like 15 girls would come because I, I just needed to find a place where they all could come and I could say the same thing. Because I was saying the same things over and over again. And uh I walked in that, the OMAC that night and there were like 300 women in there. And wow. I turned around and walked out um, and I hid in the bathroom for a solid five minutes because wow. I was just like, I don't like, I don't like public, I don't like, yeah. you know, I don't like any of this. Um, and I also knew I was about to say some things that were hard yeah. to hear. Yeah. So, or just, it's hard. It's really messy. Um, and, and again, like we're all broken, mm -hmm. you know? And so it was... I ended up just kind of talking myself into it and praying uh, to the Holy Spirit to give me some type of boldness and strength. And so I went out there and I just kind of said what I had been saying over and over again, but tried to just give it to them in a way that they understood it and that they, that whatever was helpful, you know? So that night, I think the Q&A went to like midnight and I was up till five in the morning, just 
talking with women. And I remember getting back to my apartment and there was a line of girls in the hallway and Swaf was standing in the doorway and he's like, what did you say? And I was like, <laughs> I don't even know. Um, but it was just a lot of that life stuff, a lot of relationship stuff, a lot of how do we navigate relationships with social media and texting and you know all of the drama that can be there. Um, and how do we love well? That was really what it was about, was virtue. Um, and so that kind of started this, the next day I actually had a group of guys come to me and be like, you gave a talk on relationships and you didn't invite us. Like, when's our talk? And I was like, next week, right? So, <laughs> so I ended up giving a men's talk on the Feast of St. Joseph. Nice. Um, and like 300 guys came to that. And I was, my mind was blown because I was like, whoa, like they really, like they want to know. And so I basically gave a talk called Everything the Women Want You to Know But Won't Tell You. Mm. So, and nice. it was just a great, it was just a really great talk. Because again, I'm the old married lady that can just kind of say like, this is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, so then I got really smart and started, cause I heard that girls were hiding, trying to hear what I was saying to the guys and guys were trying to pay women to record what I was saying. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so I ended up getting smart and I started giving co-ed talks and just saying the same kinds of things so that the men could hear what I said to the women and the women could hear what I said to mm -hmm. the men. And it was, it really was powerful because I think a lot of times, I mean, I always say we'll never understand, you know, again, it's hard to understand people's struggles. It's hard to understand pe people's uh, woundedness. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand the opposite sex sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard to understand what, why they feel what they feel and you know, how they, again, how they take in social media, how, you yeah. know, I mean, it's so similar and yet can yeah. be kind of different. And so just kind of giving one, one of the greatest compliments I, I receive is when people say, they'll come up to me and they like grab my face and they're like, you just articulated everything I'm feeling, but I have no words for it. You know, nice. like I didn't yeah. have the words for what you were talking about and now I do. Yeah. And I think that, that that is so of the Holy Spirit because it wasn't like I was coming up with any, I mean, I say nothing that John Paul II, St. Thomas Aquinas or Fulton Sheen or anybody else says. I don't say anything novel. I just say what they say and try to apply it to like what our amazing church, our, you know, our church and our Lord, it's just, it's just brilliance, yeah. but it's how do we give it to someone and give it to people who are in the thick and the mess and it's mm -hmm. loud and the noise of the world. How do we give that to them? Yeah. And so that's where, again, some of the marketing and some of in my brain, the way my brain works. Mm -hmm. um, I always joke, like when I go into high schools, you know, it's like, I don't bait and switch. I bait and hook because <laughs> literally nobody wants to talk about like, you know, virtue and, you know, sure. they'll, they'll sometimes high schoolers, I think are like, is she coming to talk about God? You know what yeah. I mean? She come and talk about sex and God. Like, you know, they, they almost like are like, no. Right. But then when I come in and just approach <laughs> it in a way that's like, no, I'm here to talk about relationships and I'm here to talk about bullying and drama and social media and your insecurities and your, you know, your fears and yeah. your, your doubts. And they're like, wait, what? That's what this talks about? You know what I mean? They're like, yeah. okay, I'm here. I'm listening. You know what I mean? And, um, and then I show them that I have an answer for you. Like the answer is our Lord and the peace and the joy and the freedom that only he can give. And, but it's, it's a journey to, to help people get there. And so yeah. the ministry all started in the dorms. It all started here at Benedictine. It all started in that casual conversation. That's why you know it's of the Lord is because it all happened without me even realizing it. Mm -hmm. And that's just so beautiful. You know, I, I laugh at people will ask like, so how'd you get started? And I'm like, it's so funny because I gave that talk that night to the women and they asked me, they were like, I didn't have a pen, you talk too fast. Can you like type up your notes? Like the girls asked me that. So for Valentine's Day, I typed up my notes from the talk and just basically wrote it as like a love letter to them. It's like from their Valentine. Um, and then I made copies of it at Student Life and I just put them under everybody's door. And that little piece of paper, it was like, it was like three pages. You know, yeah. it was just like this little thing. Um, I found out later that women were taking it and typing it up and blogging it so it was going out all over, and I didn't know what a blog was. I mean, yeah. I was like so stuck in my little mom world, you know? And so they were blogging it, and then that's when I started getting all these phone calls and all these emails of like, would you be willing to come and give this talk that you're giving, which I've, I'd only gave once, at KU or here at this college or at this Newman Center or at this high school? And I literally just kind of was like, wait, what? You know what I mean? And that's how you know it's of the Lord. And, yeah. um, and EWTN, it, it, this lady called me one day and said, hey, we've received this like piece of paper thing like eight times. Would you like to come on and just talk about it? On, wow. on, and I was wow. like, I'm sorry, who are, who are you? <laughs> like, I, had, I was like, I had no clue. And that's just so beautiful about yeah. the Lord is sometimes you're saying yes to something you don't know you're saying yes to. Um, and I just, I feel so blessed because like my heart, um, I just really burn with a passion to help them. 
I mean, someone told me one time, show me your misery, I'll show you your ministry. And I am no, I am in the perfect place for my heart because I just, I, I feel for, I feel for young adults. Mm -hmm. I feel for our young people. I feel for the adults that are really, truly, not only just some of it we're enduring ourselves, some of it we're trying to learn how to parent. You mm -hmm. know, I start almost every talk I give now with how proud I am of everyone in the audience because like, I don't care how old you are, we are all playing with a deck of cards that no one in the history of man has ever played with. Like, and we're just, expect, we're just expected to know what to do mm -hmm. and make it look good and then put it out for all to see. It's mm -hmm. like, oh no, please, let's, let's just do that easily. You know what I mean? And, um, and let's parent that and let's you know, endure that kind of stuff. And I, I truly feel like it's a time in history that there's just, we have to put up a fight. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, we're not, I think, I think there's like this beautiful, I don't know, part of me can sit there and be like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a lot. This is hard. This is really, you know, this is a lot. And then there's another part of me that's like, game on. I mean, yeah. if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? And I get super excited because the Lord has chosen all of us to be here for this time and to help in any way we can. And that's, it gives me just, I, I feel like I can run through a brick wall when I, when I do ministry, when I get excited about just learning young people's plight because it's, it's like nothing I've ever seen. And I thought, I, I thought high school and college were hard. Yeah. And so when I, when I look back at my time and think, yeah, it was hard, and they just have like all these, you know, extra cards to play with. And I just, my heart is just like, I'm here to help. I want to help in any way I can. Yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome whenever you get to see vulnerability happen. And oftentimes you have to be vulnerable yourself. And if you have to do that publicly in front of 500 people, that's a very <laughs> difficult thing to do. But those hard yeah. things, especially communication between the sexes, that sometimes guys just don't want to say things because it's yeah. like, I'm going to look weak or, yeah. you know, or proud or whatever it might be. Right. It's hard. Oh you know, and gosh, so when, yeah. when you have somebody publicly bring together, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about relationships yep. and say, guys, this is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. This is what they're not hearing. Yeah. Girls, this is what you're saying. This is where they're never told. Yes. You know, it's, it's all the time. And it's yeah. it's a weird I think it's because we're all wounded that we don't want to open that up because it hurts and it's scary and, and all that. So yeah. the ministry of being able to go into that space is just yeah. so, so important. Yeah. Um, and I think especially in light of social media where we get even more used to putting a mask on yes. for the world, you yeah. know, so. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> I think that was one of my biggest fears when I first started speaking. Um, one of my good friends, Chris Stefanik, mm -hmm. uh, we were on a, a team together doing a Steubenville and it was one of my first times ever doing anything like over maybe just outside of like a Benedict dinner, like crowd, you know? And, um, and I remember just being really nervous and I said, I'm not, I'm not very polished. Like I, I don't know how to give a talk and not say like, right. And, you know, and yeah. like, and, and, you know, <laughs> and I was kind of paralyzed. Cause I, I just was thinking to myself, what if I, I, I don't, I'm not been trained to do this. I don't know how to do, you know what yeah. I mean? That kind of stuff. Um, and after my talk, it was really cool. He came up to me and he was just like, you're anointed. It, awesome. He's like, you're anointed, and guess what? They actually connect with you more because you just, you're so real. And that was one of the things that I think has been such a, like, for me, I want the, whoever I'm speaking to, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or a group or, you know, from a crowd, like, of a high school or college students is, like, I just want you to know that, like, I'm here for you. Like, I, I am for you. Yeah. Like, I, I want to champion you, um, and I'm proud of you. And it's, it's it blows my mind how many times I will give a talk. And um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of standing and, and after my talk, standing at my table and sometimes seven, eight hours, you know, I'll just stand there and, and just talk with people and hug people and pray with people. And just, you know, really, that's where real ministry is, mm -hmm. is in that line. Yeah. And um, I can't even begin to tell you, I'll, I get emotional just talking about it. Just how many, again, I've been doing ministry for I'm old, like 15 years. And, yeah. you know, I just, how many glory stories I could tell you of just people who just felt loved mm -hmm. for sometimes the first time just in a conversation with me that I was also having with a thousand other people. Yeah. And for them to look at me and say, like, I've never felt more understood. Wow. I've never felt seen before. And the way that the Holy Spirit can do that in a room of 5,000 people that's of God. That's not of anyone else. And um, so I try to be just as real and as authentic. And, and that's why it's not always super polished is because I, I typically cry. I typically laugh. I, you know, I, 
I'm gl- I just I, I try to just be very the way I would be if I was with them one on one. And yeah. I think that that's what they're craving, though. Mm-hmm. They want to. I mean, everyone wants to be seen, known and loved. But I think for our young people and young adults, especially, uh, it's it's very messy right now yeah. because of, I think, the pandemic. I think mm-hmm. because of social media, online dating, um, all of just all of it, I think, has made them very guarded. Yes. Um, and also, I mean, we talk about it in Gift and Grit, but just it's very hard. The two things we see um, that are very hard for anyone at any age, I think, in this time period is conviction and commitment Mm. because it's very hard to be committed. Mm. It's very hard to say like, this is where I'm going to, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to plant my, you know, because a lot of people aren't convicted. Mm. And so kind of asking those questions and really getting them to understand, like, and even for them to see me, like Sarah Swafford, convicted and committed. Mm -hmm. What does it look like to see someone who is convicted in something and committed to something, uh, to someone And so I think that they're enamored by that. And I think that that's one of the things I have been um, just so in awe of is watching young adults and adults that are sometimes in really rough, tough, broken places um, kind of feel like, wow, you know, like she has answers. Like the Lord has answers. I don't have to live like this. I don't have to feel like this. I don't have to be here. Um, And so I think one of the things that that we talk a lot about in, in ministry is just the risk of faith, yep. taking the risk of being human, taking the risk of virtue. Um, and honestly, like this is gonna make me cry just saying it, but just like taking the risk of joy. Mm-hmm. Like I think a lot of people, afraid to they're be afraid happy. to be yeah. happy. They're afraid to, I'm never gonna tell, I, I say this in all my talks, but like everything I'm talking about, everything I say, not easy, totally worth it. And I think that that's what a lot of us have found is it's worth the risk. Yep. It's worth jumping. It's worth giving your all, even if you might be hurt, even if you don't understand everything, even if you don't feel like, you know, even if you make someone mad, even mm-hmm. if you, I mean, it's hard to be convicted and committed and keep everyone happy and everyone liking you. And that was really hard for me personally. I'm a oldest child, perfectionistic people pleaser. Yeah. I am, you know, I'm a recovering <laughs> perfectionist. Like, you know, I mean, I, my faith and my, you know, even my reversion and conversion, you know, it's, it was through a lot of, whoa, like, if I go all in with the Lord, like, what is that going to do to, to my image? What is that going to do? I mean, especially when I was in college, you know, it was like, I worked really hard for this. Like, I don't know if I'm going to throw all my chips in here. Like yeah. what? And I think like my, myself, like so many, we think when, when we're going, when we're praying about going all in with the Lord, you don't always think about everything you're going to gain. You think about everything you're going to lose. Yeah. And so for me to be able to, you know, be with people and say like, have you considered what you're going to gain? I think that sometimes they, they haven't. And so it's just, it's really beautiful. It is the joy of my life. I will go to my grave walking with people and just telling them like how loved they are, um, how they're worth it, how they're worth the fight, uh, that they're not alone and that there is a plan for their life and it is amazing, but it's going to involve risk. It's gonna involve commitment and it's gonna involve con- a conviction. And, um, and then walking with them, because that means something different for every single human being. Mm-hmm. Because everyone has a different story, everyone has a different background, everyone has a different personality. And, but isn't that what makes it fun? I yeah. mean, isn't that what makes, li- makes life great? Yeah, yeah the adventure of it. Um, and that's what so many of our saints, I think, show us so well. Yeah, yeah freedom is scary. It is. And that, that's strange, like we want to be free, but yet the actual freedom that we're called to have we're, we're scared to death oh, to jump gosh. into it, you know, because it's it's so much easier to try to control your fate or whatever you want to call it. But right. uh, the adventure is not knowing, mm-hmm. you know, that what, what God is calling you to. So, but you Absolutely. mentioned, um, you know, being in ministry for, for 15 years, I would imagine you've seen, I mean, we have enduring, you know, human malignities that just we've always dealt with since yeah. the beginning of time, which is sin and, and, and death and things like that. Right. But the culture, especially in the last 20 years, we're about the same age. And so I went to college around the same time, still yeah. with the same issues, right. same deal of like, I didn't have to deal with social media. So I had no idea what that was like. Even texting, I, I didn't, couldn't text my girlfriend, who's not my wife, you know, that just didn't exist. <laughs> right. um, so within, you know, the, the 20 years of coming out of college, it's like, oh wow, this thing went like a hundred miles an hour very quickly. And it really specifically messed with human relationships and how we communicate with each other, how we especially gain meaning even, um, you know, all of that. So 
Um, what have you seen that obviously has, has, has endured, but what are some of the major shifts that you're seeing, like, especially young people dealing with today that maybe we, as a church or as, as a community, we don't quite have the language yet of, like, right. what do you do with something yeah. that's so new? Oh, my gosh. I know. <clears throat> I wish I had all the answers. Yeah. I mean, I, as a parent, you know, like my oldest is about to be 18, you know, and so all the way down to eight months, mm -hmm. you know, I have six kids. And so it's, it's interesting to wrestle with this. One of our mutual good friends, Bobby Angel, just wrote a book on gaming. And so, I mean, you have social media, you have gaming, you have online dating. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these, the, I mean, just the, I get kind of overwhelmed sometimes with even just like streaming. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, remember the day when you had to like, get the VHS from like, the, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was like uh, my dad, my parents, we were joking about this at Christmas was um, when we would get to go on a Friday night to go to like Blockbuster and like all three kids had to pick one. We had to pick, try to pick one movie like from the wall, you know? And now we sit down and it's like scroll. I mean, you just, it's just unbelievable. And so I think that one of the things, I mean, we're Oregon Trail generation, right? Like I grew up with um, an email address in high school, you know, like an internet but I think that it's unbelievable how quickly it, how quickly it, it advanced. And so I think what I'm seeing more than anything is there, it's hard, I think, sometimes for the parents and the grandparents of this generation to understand because I think we, like, we have it, but it's different for us because we weren't formed with it at an early age. So, like, it was around but not as, you know, prevalent um, one of the stories I like to tell that really, I think, embodies this is I met this dad years ago, probably 10 plus years ago, and uh, he came to my talk and he came up to me afterwards and he goes, I really like everything you just said. And I go, thank you. He was an older gentleman and he goes, I have eight children. The first four went through without cell phones and the second four went through with cell phones. And he said, he goes, the first four we had a phone hanging on the wall in the kitchen. And he goes, I knew who was dating who, I knew how it was going, and I knew when it ended. <laughs> and he, you know what I mean? And, and he was yeah. laughing, and I was laughing, because I was like, yeah, that was my house too, you know? And, um, and then he got really serious, and he goes, with the second four, he goes, I didn't know who was dating who, mm. and I didn't know how it was going, but I knew when it ended. Mm. Oh, and gosh. my heart just was like, wow. Because there was just this, heaviness mm -hmm. that I think he carried, which was like, the dads even want to know, like they want to yeah. be a part of it. And how do you, how do you be a part of your kids' lives when so much of it is just not like you can't be there with them, you mm -hmm. know? So it was, it was the first time I had ever felt this kind of, it's not just a worry, but it's almost like a sadness yeah. that I feel like I'm missing something. Um, I remember having junior high, I had a junior high talk and these junior high dads came up and they were just like emotional and they're like, I feel like I'm losing my daughter because she's always on her phone. She's like texting under the table or she just comes home and takes her phone to the room. This, I mean, again, we're talking 10 plus years ago, you know? And I remember thinking, okay, how are we going to like, how do we handle this? What do we do? You know, as, as a doer and a fixer, I'm like, okay, look, okay, phones, let's right. figure this out, you know? And these, 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 you know, they were like, what can we do? And I remember trying to think about it. And then I noticed something like five years later, because I used to have all these parents used to come up like, what are we going to do about phones? What are we going to do about, you know, Snapchat? What are we going to do about F Facebook? Like all this stuff. Um, and then all of a sudden I noticed about five years later, I didn't have as many parents coming to me asking about what we're going to do. But I did have people coming to me talking about phones. And it was teens coming to me and saying, yeah, I can't get my parents' attention. They're just on their phones oh, all the time. They're like not available. Wow. And I remember just seeing the shift. And it was probably about five, seven years ago. And to be honest, people still come to me and talk about, like, what do we do? But not as often. Interesting. And I have a feeling that a lot of people have just kind of Given it yeah. resigned themselves to be like, this is just how it is. And I think it's really important for all of us because, like, I'm not a phone hater, not a social media hater, not a, you know, I, I think there's a place for all of it. I, I pray a special prayer when I hold my phone sometimes, like, John Paul II, what would you do with this? Like, yeah. St. Paul, what would you do with this? Like, because I know St. Maximin Colby, what would you do with this? I mean, he was, when he was taken to Auschwitz, he was, like, putting together a TV. Mm -hmm. He was literally trying to blast out the, you know, Militia of the Immaculata over a TV. So, like, they would have used it. So the question is, what, how do we do this, right? I mean, so I'm not a hater, but I think that it's really good to take that big step back and to be honest about the fact that we are the guinea pig generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to be honest about it. Our kids are guinea pigs. Yes. And I think that 
it's not to like scare us, but I think it's to put us like in a new um, understanding of don't just drink at that trough and be like, I'm sure it's fine. You know what I mean? So, so I'm not a hater, but I'm also, because a lot of people be like, oh, well, I hate phones. And I, I remember one, this one dad was like, oh, really? Like, I actually think phones are fine because I'm, I'm okay if my high school boy calls his high school friend. It's the data that's yeah. scary. And I was like, that, that's kind of a great point. Like, cause you know, everyone's like, we actually would love for people to call each other more, sure, right? Like, yeah. I mean, there's kind of something that's like, let's call each other. Um, but it's the data, it's the unaccountability. There, there's no accountability for a lot of people. It's just this computer in your pocket, you know? Yeah. So I've seen, I think what I have seen more than anything is this, again, 15 year shift. Yeah. And it just continues to shift. I mean, Facebook is different than Instagram. Instagram's different than Twitter. Twitter's different. I mean, when Snapchat came on the scene, totally different. TikTok's different. I mean, I'm aging myself. Like, I mean, when people watch this, it might be something totally different. Like, yeah. so I think that that's the thing that is so interesting is I think the Lord would ask us to look at it and say, I'm a huge, uh, I'm a fan of Dave Ramsey, you know, and, and he has that line, like, if you don't control your money, it will control you. And I've told people before, it's same with emotions. If you don't control your emotions, they'll control you. And I think we can go ahead and add it in. If you don't control your phone, it will control you. And I think that it's just a way to say, like, how do we apply virtue to our phones? Mm -hmm. How do we apply, you know, our faith to our phones? Yeah. Uh, I was just telling some young adults, uh, this other young adult uh, gave me this awesome idea for Lent. They, she took all of her, inst all like Instagram and all her social media apps and put them on the very last page of her phone. And then she put all her prayer apps on nice. every page before <laughs> that. So she's like, I have to pass Jesus three times to get to my social media. <laughs> and I was like, brilliant. Because again, like, it's not like you can't have it. It's not like it's evil, but there is, I mean, it's neutral, right? Yeah. It's how we use it. And so I think the Lord is asking us to not be slaves to it. Yeah. Um, I also love, I read the book, um, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Um, mm -hmm. It's this phenomenal book for, by a Protestant pastor who decided to leave his job. He left the mega church and decided because it was just too much, he'd burnt yeah. out. And one of the things that he says in there, and I love thinking about this with social media, is he says, he talks about just like, I'm my worst person when I'm in a hurry. And I'm my worst person when I'm distracted. And I just think about the phone just makes us hurry. Yes. And it makes us distracted. Yes. And so I always think about that. He, he was just talked about how he started looking at the things in his life that took him away from the people most important to him mm -hmm. and the things that made him stressed and uncomfortable and like just not there. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that our young people and I think human beings need more than ever is emotional, like affirmation, affection, mm -hmm. attachment. I mean, there's something so real about being in person. And um, I, I get worried sometimes. I, I can definitely tell that, that some young adults and young people, they struggle with eye contact. They struggle mm -hmm. with, you know, talking. They struggle with a conversation. They struggle with being themselves in yeah. person. And so I want to help them do that. I want to, you know, and that doesn't mean we have to like flush our phones. It just means, okay, okay, we know that that doesn't always help, right? Like yeah. being our truest self isn't typically social media, right? right? So like, how do I be my truest self with the people around me that I love? How do I do conflict management? Yeah. How do I handle drama? How do I handle not getting my way? How do I handle disappointment? Those are the, the real human things that I want, I want them to have. And so that's why I'm so big on friendship and being with your people and, and finding your friends. And mm -hmm. so we, you know, I'm really pushing people towards that, that communication and that contact that is just irreplaceable. Yeah. And not that, you know, you might need to text someone to tell you where we're all meeting up. But then once you get there, like I was in, when I was in Australia, I went out to dinner with some young adults and they had a rule where they would get together once a week. And when they got to dinner, they would all put their phones in the middle of the table face down. Nice. And the first person to grab their phone had to pay the bill. And I was like, <laughs> brilliant. Um, so I just, I love little practicals like that of how can we kind of like hold ourselves accountable yeah. to being human. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the greatest way to say it is, the, you know, I've come to give you life and to give it, give it to you to the fullest. And I think that a lot of us have not even scratched the surface of what fullest means. Yes. And that's the adventure of life we're talking about. And I don't want people to miss it. And so that's why I think, again, just trying to get their attention. Because once you get a taste of that life and to the fullest, it, everything else becomes a little counterfeit, a little yep. not as savory, a little, mm, I kind of feel like I'm wasting my time. Yeah, plastic. Plastic or just... <laughs> This is a means to an end. Yes. Like this is a means to an end. This is not the end. Yes. And just being able to 
to kind of raise that flag and be like, I'm not a hater, but let's just kind of look at what we might be missing out on. Yeah. That was something that I just, I've been really praying through that even in my own personal life. You know, it's it, saying yes also means saying no. Yeah. And saying no also means saying yes to something else. And so, you know, sometimes I think we just blindly go with it. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I gotta get this done, or I gotta do this, or I gotta do this, or I gotta do this. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to make those radical changes of, of I'm gonna give this up for a little bit, or I'm not gonna, you know, be a slave to this or that. Um, and the steps that it has to take to get there can be hard. So Yeah, it's interesting. Something that I've noticed um, in young people in particular is there's almost a, <laughs> I don't want them to rebel in the sense of, you know, something bad. But right. every teenage generation has something that they're rebelling against, right? Like, oh, yeah. I grew up wearing the Jinkos and trying to, you know, <laughs> listen to the music my parents hated and all right, that kind of right, stuff. Right. Like, that absolutely was part of, you know, before that where there was grunge and all that kind of stuff, right? right? And it seems to me like, that spirit is kind of dissipated uh, in this generation coming up. And to me, the new rebellion is to do exactly what you're talking about, of like, get embodied again. Like, rebel against the things that are trying to guinea pig you. Yeah. And that's mm. that should be the new rebellion of like, get your life together because they're trying to take you towards this thing. And the man, which is technology or these huge corporations that want to addict us to these things, it's like, let's, let's rebel against that. Right. Like, that's the thing that we all need to kind of get up in arms about yeah, right. and, and be grunge about again, right. you know? But no, I totally, I, I, you're speaking my language. Um, yeah, what does rebel culture look like right now? Yeah. It, it Honestly, it looks like old fashioned dating. Yes. That is literally, I have guys all the time come up and be like, will you give a talk on flirting? Like how to yeah. flirt again? I'm like, I'd love to, let's, <laughs> let's do it, you know? And yeah. I have, um, but again, it's like, what does that look like? You know, it, it's kind of saying, I don't want to be controlled. Mm -hmm. And I think that, once you kind of start feeling like, wait, what? Yeah. And I think, I think some of our young people and adults are starting to feel like, I've played this game for a while and I don't feel free. Yes. I don't feel empowered. I don't feel the things that I thought I was gonna feel. I feel kind of trapped. Yes. I feel kind of isolated. I feel lonely. And I think we're starting to put words to some of those feelings mm -hmm. and I'm seeing that as well. And so, yeah, what's the rebel culture look like? Oh my gosh, it looks like virtue and it looks <laughs> yeah. like faith and it looks exactly. like I don't, you know, I'm not just going to use people for my own sake yes. and I'm not going to feed the machine, yes. if you will. I think that's exactly what you're saying is, is spot on. I tell this to young guys about porn is like that industry is trying to control you. Mm, yeah. And so your rebellion is to say you're not going to have my brain. Mm -hmm. Like the dopamine that you're fixing me to is just not, I'm not going to let you have that. And right. so it, it's, it puts a per, or at least puts an entity in the way of like, yes. go rebel against that. Yeah, you know, as, and I think that there's a natural desire in teenagers, especially in young college kids, oh, to yeah. rebel against something. Yes. It's like, that's the thing. Oh, like, yeah, it's it's sure. sin and death that we're rebelling against, right? That the, but oh, we have gosh. to give them practical understanding of like, yeah, the porn industry is trying to control you. So is the phone industry. So is, I mean, they go to actual, you know, uh, uh, casinos to figure out how addictive the buttons can be and make them as addictive as possible. Nice. So like, let's figure out how to, to fight against that, yeah. not to fight against the technology itself because it's a good, yeah, uh, but right. to fight against the ability to be controlled in that way. Yeah, totally. um, even though that sounds conspiracy, but it's like, no, that's absolutely what they're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that's not, not a conspiracy trying, at all. We're just kind of calling it a spade. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and I think that also, I mean, the, the what you're really pushing at is beautiful. And I think that they're young adults, it, it's a, you know, high school, college, junior high even, it's a time in your life where it's like my husband always says, it's this newfound confidence and this like hidden insecurity. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I got this. I got this life. Like I'm, I'm fine. Scared of that. Yeah. Well, but I mean, and I see that in young people. It's like, don't tell me what to do. Wait, I'm sorry. What am I supposed to do? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I, and I remember feeling that way too. For and sure. so I think that they're looking for people to trust. And so I think that I think they're on to it that, oh, maybe I don't need to trust TikTok and maybe I don't need to trust, you know, Cosmopolitan and maybe I don't need to trust the porn industry, maybe not super trustworthy. You know what I mean? Like for what I want for my life. But then the problem is I think the church and, you know, Benedictine College, ministries, apostolates, I know Focus is doing great things, SPO, you see all these apostolates kind of coming together and saying like, circle the wagons. Like we got to circle the wagons. The church has to be a voice that's there and available for when they say, wait, what, so what do you have to offer? Mm -hmm. So like, I feel kind of taken and I feel duped and I'm, I've been used and I hurt and I'm angry and I'm frustrated. Like, do you have answers for me? Mm -hmm. And I think that that has always been the church's role is the church has beautiful answers, but it's how to, how do we give them 
-hmm. to people in a way that they can understand it, mm -hmm. in a way that they don't feel threatened, in a way that they don't feel, in, they don't need to feel like it's over their head. It's, you know what I mean? I think for a lot of young adults, it's sometimes it's like, well, I'm not gonna understand this anyway. And they just shut down, you know? Like theology of the body, you know, things like this. It's like, I don't really understand what you're talking about, or I don't want, I don't want to believe what you're talking yeah. about, you know? And so being able to articulate it in a way that they feel loved and they feel understood, and I'm not scared of their questions. You're not, you're not scared of their questions. I think that's probably one of my favorite things about ministry and, yeah. and even college students and young adults is they have great questions. They make me pray harder. They make me seek. They make me go find the sources. And that's the, the beauty of my faith and my conviction is that I know I can find the answers. Yeah. And so it's like being able to, they, I have been fed so much in my life by just walking this path mm -hmm. with friends and relatives and just doing ministry and also just knowing so many college students. I mean, we live across the street and just being able to open our home and be able to, to hear people and hear their stories. And I mean, sin is never unique, but our times are. Mm. And so just being able to really approach this with honestly, our minds, our hearts, our creativity. I think social media can be one of the greatest weapons against the evil one if we can figure out how to yield it. Mm. And I'm pumped. I think it's great. I, I just think we have to, again, that's why I love what we're doing. I love what you're doing. I love the idea of transforming the culture. I mean, there's no, what else should we be doing with our time than yeah. bringing people to the Lord and helping them with, through their woundedness? And it's, again, it's, I just, I love, the Lord just knows, he knows what he's doing. And so to lean into that and keep it simple, stupid. I mean, it's just, it really is. I, I think that that's how we approach it because sometimes I think a lot of young adults and adults are just looking for anybody that can help them walk this life. Um, I've seen that more than ever. It's, it's people looking around going, there has to be more, right? I'm like, yeah, there's more. Come, <laughs> come hang out, eat cookie dough, drink wine with Sarah. <laughs> depending on your age, you either yeah. will drink a glass of wine or eat cookie dough, depending on how old you are, right? So, yeah. but yeah, I, I just, I think that we're, we're I think, I think we're on to something. Thank you for listening to the Benedictine Dialogues. We'll be right back to the show after this brief message. Greatness does not begin in comfort. Greatness begins in the heart of a storm. Benedictine monks followed an impossible call to leave the old world behind and bring the order of St. Benedict to America. The light of the Virgin Mary led them to a chosen place on the bluffs of the Missouri River. Benedictine sisters answered the call, knowing they would face persecution, guided forward by a light that delivered them to sanctuary. Together, these brave men and women founded Benedictine College, where community, faith, and scholarship light the path. Not away from the storm, but through it. In the 21st century, Ravens answer the call. Working together to innovate and inspire, serving Christ in each and every person, committed to a greatness that no challenge can overcome. Ravens, wherever your call may lead, you will weather the storm. You will carry the light. You will transform culture in America. And now, back to the show. We've mentioned uh, the new book, um, yeah. so tell us a little bit about that and maybe the inspiration behind it, which you'd love to see your readers get out of it. Yeah, well, we wrote this book be, like basically as an answer to the conversation you and I just had. Okay. Um, I mean, it, this is the conversation yeah. we've been having for 15 <laughs> years. Um, when we, you know, my husband and I, we have been blessed to, again, live in the dorms. You know, we hang out with college students a lot. We do a lot of ministry. We love doing marriage ministry. We love doing ministry for young adults, for adults. Like, we really love it all. And we kind of decided a couple of years ago that it was time to put a lot of the things that we say all the time somewhere. 
And that's what this book became. We wrote it together, which is, it's beautiful. We're still married. Uh, we were able to write it. I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, like we, it was, it was funny. It was like, if you can write a book together and stay married, it's really great. So um, we had eight different versions that we passed back and forth. That's it funny. took almost three years. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's really a book where you just get, it feels like you're sitting down with us, which I think is what people long for is, you know, it's almost like they're reading a conversation among people around my island, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so, but when we, we wrote this book, um, Gift and Grit, because what we were seeing, and, and we see it in the college students, we walk with a lot of students, is that it kind of boils down to your life is a gift. And it is so hard to believe that. Hmm. Like to believe that you're a gift, that you're beloved, that you're the beloved son or daughter of God, to believe that, to be convicted of that, that your life is a gift, is really hard to understand that the meaning and purpose of your life is to give your life away as a gift. So hard. Mm -hmm. So hard to understand, to comprehend. It's, it is just complete opposite of what the world says. So to know you're a gift, to know your life is a gift, and then to know that the meaning and purpose of your life is to give it away, do you have the grit to do that? And grit is, it is gritty to heal. Mm -hmm. It is gritty to have a prayer life. It is gritty to forgive. It's gritty to be selfless. I would argue that that's probably one of the greatest human characteristics that anyone could ever have. I don't care if you're a spouse or a child or a parent or a friend or a coworker. When you can look at someone and be like, they're just selfless. It's like, what? Like, but is that not what you want to be? Is that not what you want to be for others? Like, just trying to get out of our own way, you know? And, and again, kind of the vices of our life and, you know, the, the wounds and the pain, uh, the brokenness of our lives. Having to face that takes grit. It takes fortitude. It takes risk and patience and it is so hard. And so the book is basically walking through different times, different parts of our own lives. We tell our stories, our conversion stories. We talk about different times that we've had to lean into the gift part and times we've had to lean into the grit part. And we get very, very real. Um, because again, doing ministry, it's like, I'm not gonna dance around this. Like it just, yeah. we're just gonna say it. Um, so it's, it's a, one of those books that I think, um, I've had people of all ages tell me they're like, it was exactly, exactly where I was at. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, it was exactly where I was at and exactly what I needed for this time. It was very timely. And that was, I think it's just because it's the fruit of just so many conversations. I mean, probably, easily a thousand conversations either yeah. between us or with us with others where it's like we are all in this together and we are all suffering you know we're all in the same boat we're all seasick I mean that's kind of kind of the joke but it's true <laughs> you know and so to be able to look at each other and say you're not alone and and then to take some things it's very practical so we wanted something that was very practical so one chapter is called can men and women be friends one nice. chapter is all on breakups and just how brutal that can be, you know? One whole chapter is just how to make friends. Hmm. You know, I, I don't care how old you are. It's hard to make friends. It's hard to start over. It's hard to move. It's hard to change. It's hard to leave old friendships mm -hmm. or even to just say, I need, some, I need some other friends in my life too, you know? Those are really gritty things to do. Um, and then also how to, have a, how to have a prayer life, how to have a spiritual life, you know? I think a lot of times I see this a lot with young people like, well, my mom and dad just say, pray about it. I don't know how to pray. Yeah. Like, my teacher said to pray about it. Like, what the heck does that mean? You know what I mean? Like, um, I, I meet a lot of adults yeah. uh, who, 50, 60, 70 years old, who say, now, this prayer life you're talking about, like, what exactly do you mean by that? And I think that that's, like, what a beautiful question. Mm -hmm. And so we took the time to really, like, go through those things that are not just simple, but hard and complex. Um, but it's really a gift from my heart and from Andy's heart to, to the other heart. You know, it's very much a, hey, if we could go to dinner with you, this is exactly what we would want you to hear and yeah. probably, probably what we would tell you. You know what I mean? If you asked us questions, this is probably the things we would say. So it's just nice to have it somewhere yeah. to be like, yeah, this, there's a chapter on that. Like, I have something for you to read. You know, like, because yes. uh, I'll have questions and I'll be like, chapter 10. You know what I mean? This, <laughs> nice. um, and that's how Emotional Virtue was too. My, my first book that I wrote, Emotional Virtue, it was very much just me having to put words to the things I was saying over and over mm -hmm. again. And, and when people say, you know, will you say to her what you told me? You know, yeah. it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll tell her. And then <laughs> I was like, maybe I should write it down and then you should hand it to her, you know? So um, it's just the fruit of ministry. And I'm just happy that it can be somewhere. 
Yeah, so my, my two sons that are in high school right now, their basketball coach actually bought a copy for their whole team uh, there. So we had a couple conversations oh, uh, with it, which was awesome. Uh, but what I, what I really love about it is you're a human being. Human beings have these experiences, and you should want those experiences, even the hardships, yeah. even the painful uh, right. experiences, because that's what makes you human. The living part. Yes, yes, because so much of the culture tries to pull us away from being fully expressed human beings. And so I love the fact that it's, it's very practical, but it also brings in some kind of more theological understanding of what we're talking about. Um, but but go be a human being because being a human being is awesome. Yes. <laughs> like, right, right, right. Like, yeah. <laughs> Scary, yes. Fun, yes. Yeah. Uh, exhilarating, yes. I just think that um, Swaff and I talk a lot about, uh, and it sounds kind of morbid, but it's not. I mean, memento mori, right? Like just those deathbed experiences. You know, you're laying on your deathbed and you're like, did I live? Mm -hmm. Like, did I really live? Did I really spend the time I wanted to spend with my spouse, with my kids, with my parents? Um, nothing's guaranteed. Nothing yes. is, tomorrow is not guaranteed. And I think sometimes our world likes to live like we're in, we're invincible. We're, you know, never gonna die. We'll leave, live it up and mm -hmm. um, ask questions later. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, no, you know, I, I I say that a lot in my you know in my talks is there's you know especially for young adults like there's no altar switch. You don't just get on an altar no matter what your vocation is and flip a switch and instantly become the person you've always wanted to mm -hmm. be. Like a lot of people think that game day is that day no matter what vows you're taking. But I always say game day is today. Yeah. Like this is game day. And every single decision you're making is taking you closer or further from the person you want to be on that day. Mm -hmm. And so if you're talking deathbed stuff, what are you doing today that's going to take you closer to the person you want to be when you're laying there? Yeah. And also just looking back on your life, like, no regrets, you know? Like, I, th I think that's probably, you know, Andy read this quote the other day, and I was like, oh, my gosh. And it was just talking about how there's a generation of, of people walking around that will die without the spouse they never had, hmm. the kids they never had, and the God they never knew. Wow. And yeah, gosh. it's like, wow. And, it's, and a lot of it's like, you know, that's not just like people who didn't, couldn't find a spouse. This is just people who are like, I don't have a place for God. I don't have a place for people. I don't, I'm going to live for myself. Um, it's very in vogue right now to just live for yourself. And I'm worried about their deathbed because I think they're going to be very lonely. And I think they're going to look back and go, I, I didn't really live. I didn't really give... I didn't really give myself to anyone. I didn't really give my life away. I just held so tightly. And I think that's, that's a word of warning for all of us because I think that sometimes even it's the vanity and the pride of all of us of mm -hmm. just, I need this to look good or I need this to go a certain way or I'm not gonna be happy. The ifs and I'll be happy if and whens of our mm -hmm. life. And, and to be able to, to not, I, I mean, that's not living in freedom. Yeah. You know, and so I think when you, when you have that, that deep conviction in the Lord and you have that faith, However imperfect, however, I mean, we're all going to mess up. We're all going to fail. We're, we're never going to get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, I was given a mom's, I, I was doing a mom's retreat and it was, um, the title of my talk that they gave me was you're a good enough mom. And I'm speaking to a hundred moms and you know, I'm sitting there. I mean, we're all just kind of laughing at the title. Cause it's like, <laughs> I'm not a good enough mom. Like, you know, you have that feeling like that constantly the world's like, you're not enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. Um, and I kind of just told the women, I was like, we're all like, you know, we're all going to always feel like we're not gonna be enough. I was like, but with the Lord, you're enough. And I said, and you know what? You're never gonna be perfect, but what you are is irreplaceable to those kids, to your husband, to the people in your life. And I think that's, that's my word to, I think, human beings right now. It's like, you're not perfect. You don't look perfect. You're not gonna get it right. You don't understand everything. You're, everything is not gonna go perfectly, but you're irreplaceable. Like, you're a gift to the people around you. And so then, I mean, one of the things to talk about in the book is, like, then play your role. Like, mm -hmm. jump in there. Like, jump, get after it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, and that, I think that's what people want. You know, like, meaning that is self-made is no meaning at all. Yeah. And to, like, you don't want to, like, write yourself into a story. You want to be, you want to be cast. Mm -hmm. you, wanna, you want someone to say, you, I want you for this. And that's the Lord saying, you, I want you for this. And then to go live that life and, and like, what are you keeping from others by not living that life? Mm -hmm. And just the beauty of, of embracing that and embracing our Lord and the people around you. But it's going to be gritty because you have to, to, again, to be convicted of, of the gift that you are. And then to be able to give your life away in that selflessness. So hard. Yes. And our world just looks at it like, 
cannot wrap its head around it. Yeah. And so again, rebel culture, hey, <laughs> we just become rebel culture again, right? Exactly, so, yes. exactly. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, we only have a few minutes uh, left, so I thought maybe to kind of wrap, um, I'd love to bring it back to the college. And, yeah. you know, if, if there are any future students or, or potential parents that are watching, um, you know, why, why have been in college? Why should they become oh a my raven? Gosh. I told you I needed four <laughs> hours. I need four hours for that answer as well. Um, you know, one of the things that I say a lot because again, I, I'm biased with a capital B. Sure. So, but I love Benedictine College and I, there are some great schools out there. Um, but one of the things I always tell young adults is you're not just choosing a college, you're choosing a formation. Hmm. Because wherever you go to, to college, you will be formed. And so visit, try them out. I always say trying to pick a college online is like picking out jeans online, it ain't gonna happen. You have to go try them on. You have to go visit all those schools because sometimes it's a process of elimination. It's like, I felt more comfortable at the school, you know, because mm -hmm. a lot of times I think people are like, why do you live in Kansas? Like, why do you, like, Jared, why do you live in Kansas? You know, like, <laughs> what, what is going on? Like, and, and then people visit and they go, ah, oh, I get it. I get yeah. it. You know what I mean? There's something about this place and the people mm -hmm. and the community and the traditions. But number one, it's the faith. Like, you can feel like the Holy Spirit lives here. And the Holy Spirit moves in this place. And I have watched thousands of people come and go. I mean, again, I get emotional because it's like, it's not just, uh, these are not just like stories I'm telling you. These are people that I love, mm -hmm. you know? And so to be able to watch people grow and change, you know, I, I know a lot of them in high school because I meet them or I'll, I'll meet them on the road or I'll meet them, you know, as they're coming to visit. And then, then to watch them cross the stage of graduation and just seeing how much they've grown and their faith and, and just their, even just their, their per, like personhood, you know, mm -hmm. just their humanity grow and change. And I'm so proud of them. I mean, I cry like a baby at, at graduation. <laughs> it's just sad because I want everyone to stay forever. I mean, that's the other problem. I'm just like, oh, it's so hard when they leave. Um, but then you watch another whole new batch of Ravens come in and you're just like, man, I'm so proud of them because they, they get it. You yeah. know, they get, they get what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And with transforming culture in America, with bringing Christ to everyone you meet, with the rule of St. Benedict, you know, meet everyone you, you know, everyone you meet, treat them as though they are Christ, you know, they, they get it. Yeah. And I'm just so proud of them. And, and so I, I just feel so honored to be a part of the community and to be a part of something that you just can believe in and mm -hmm. you can get behind. And, you know, I've watched the administration and faculty and staff just pour their hearts and their lives into these students. Um, and then just to watch them go out and set the world on fire, it just, it is just the greatest gift. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that you asked me to come and talk about all this because I could talk about it for hours. Um, but I'm also just so grateful for everything that Benedictine's doing for the culture. I'm just, I'm, I, again, I, it's so fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fun. It is. It is. Well, thank you again for coming. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we will absolutely have to have you back I to talk it. about it. some more stuff. So. Absolutely. Let's get both of you in here. Make theological, you know, <laughs> all the high stuff. I love absolutely. It, so. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for listening and watching. Uh, be sure to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Be sure to pick up a copy of the new Swafford book, Gift and Grit. And um, thank you again for listening and God bless. We hope you enjoyed the Benedictine Dialogues, a production of Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. To catch all the latest and support our growing platform, visit media.benedictine.edu. And be sure to recommend this show to your friends and family. Help us to transform culture in America, one conversation at a time.